What's up, Wizards? Dev, SPMTG, Magic Talk. And today's a big day because we officially know every single card in Kaldheim, baby. It's the last day of preview season. And today we're going to go over all the cards that we saw this afternoon, but we're not quite done with spoiler season just yet. Tomorrow, I'm going to put out the best of the rest video. And then after that, it's top 10 sleepers, top 25 cards, ranking every card in the whole set for limited. And then, of course, deck techs and stuff. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and do all that stuff because there's a lot of content coming up, but you came for today's content, so let's talk about these cards. Now, to begin, even some of the commons and uncommons are really cool today. We got to see Starnheim, Corsair, and Valor of the Worthy. Corsair is three mana, two and a white for a two, two Pegasus with flying, artifact, and enchantment spells you cast. Costs one less to cast, so Transcendent Envoy that also let you cast artifacts for cheaper. Pretty sweet little card there, especially for commander players. Valor of the Worthy is just one white mana for an aura that enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one. And whenever the creature leaves the battlefield, create a one, one white spirit creature token with flying. So it turns the creature into a better doomed traveler because it's not just when the creature dies, it's when it leaves the battlefield. So if it's bounced or exiled or whatever, you still get the spirit token. I'm obviously not too sure this card is worth playing, but there's a green white or mono white or black white <laughs> enchantments deck with all the glitters and luris and stuff that people have been trying to make a thing for the last like year and a half so maybe this card goes in because it's a really really cheap aura we also saw the other four cards in the rune cycle today and we did see the blue one a while back thank you for pointing that out to me multiple of you i appreciate that uh but i'm not sure that i covered the blue one when it first came around and now i can firmly say i think the blue one is probably the best one out of all of these because they're not super impressive they're all two mana auras that can enchant any permanent that's kind of noteworthy but you mostly want to put them on creatures and equipments to get the full amount of juice out of them because if they're on a creature they give a creature a keyword ability if they're on an equipment they give the equipment the ability to grant that keyword ability like rune of sustenance the white one enchants a permanent and when it enters the battlefield you draw a card all of them draw a card when they ETB, which is easily the best part of them, but the white one gives the creature lifelink or the equipment that it enchants, the ability to grant lifelink. The green one, Rune of Might, one and a green, all of them two mana, draws a card when it ETBs, and the creature gets plus one, plus one, and trample. This is one of the only ones that gives a power boost, besides Rune of Speed, the red one. This one gives the creature haste in plus one, plus O, oh, and I think that that might be the other best one in the cycle besides the blue one. Rune of Mortality gives the creature death touch which isn't bad either so altogether i'm not sure how playable any of these are but obviously the white one seems a little bit more playable just because it's definitely in the all that glitters deck almost certainly same thing with cards like rune of might and rune of mortality which again have a chance to be in those you know luris or all that glitters decks so i kind of like their chances although i think the white one is slightly better than the black one for all intents and purposes but that said i think the red one is really interesting and the blue one is typically the one that sees the most play when we get these kind of effects but it all kind of remains to be seen they might be better if they're tied together with rune forge champion which is actually one of the better cards we saw today it's two and a white for a two three dwarf warrior and when it etbs you may search your library and or graveyard for a rune card reveal it put it into your hand search your library this way shuffle it you may pay one rather than pay the mana cost for rune spells that you cast so this effectively halves the mana cost for runes and cuts out all color requirements, which is really, really sweet. And it searches for a thing when it ETBs, and that thing can be in your graveyard too, which is actually pretty sweet. Altogether, I'm not super sure this is great. Maybe you play it on turn four so you can immediately stick a rune to it, in which case it's a little bit better, but still not super impressive. But it'll still effectively draw you a card the turn it enters the battlefield if you pull that sequence off. So it's not a terrible card. Um, it's definitely nowhere near as good as the card it's supposed to be reminiscent of. <laughs> you know, But I still think that it's kind of cool. I'm not sure that it ultimately ends up even going in the decks that it wants to be in. Right, Those Lurus decks can't play anything that's three um, and those decks that want to play like Satessan Champion probably don't have all the room in the world for other three drops so and they probably have better auras to play than all these runes in the first place so who knows if Runeforge Champion is really good enough but I imagine if you open it and draft you can build a whole really cool deck around it so maybe we'll try and do that but ultimately I gotta be convinced this card is Dece 
But keeping it pushing, we also saw Vengeful Reaper today. Four mana, but not really. For a 2-3 Angel Cleric with Flying, Death Touch, and Haste, it has Foretell for one and a black. I actually don't mind this. It's like a Vampire Nighthawk, but much more aggressive. Sheds the lifelink, gains haste instead. I think that's really, really cool, especially on a Foretell creature. To give it haste is pretty nice, because it's only going to cost you two mana on turn three or four, and this is... When you think about it, kind of an acceptable three drop for the elves, or not the elves deck, the angels deck. I don't know why I said elves. <laughs> but you know, you foretell it on turn two, and then on turn three you get it down, and it's not too shabby. I don't mind this thing at all, and in limited especially, it's a ridiculous card. Even if you have to pay all four mana for it, it ain't too shabby in limited because it's going to take down your opponent's big bomb flyer or whatever, or just threaten the board for you. So I kind of like a lot about this card. I'm not sure that it's destined to see too much standard play or anything but in limited this thing is a nice uncommon. We also finished off this uncommon land cycle today with Great Hall of Starnheim. Really cool art here. It ETBs tapped and taps her a black. And you can pay white, white, black, tap, sacrifice it, and a creature you control to create a 4-4 angel warrior creature token with flying and vigilance. Activate this ability only any time you could cast the sorcery. So again, you can't do this at instant speed, which would be really nice, considering it requires sacking a creature. So if your opponent were to target a thing with a removal spell, you could sack it in response but I guess not. That kind of sucks. <laughs> this is only sorcery speed, but still, even with requiring the sacrificing of a creature, there's plenty of ways to turn that into an upside, especially in the Angel's deck, which, if it doesn't necessarily have, like, an Aristocrats theme, it at least has, some, like, a kind of graveyard sub-theme in a way, so you could kind of turn this into an upside by using any of the various Angel's cards that want you to have stuff in your yard, so I could kind of see this being good. Of course, I think it goes in the Angel's deck most times, even if it's just a one or two of uh, so I'm kind of excited to play a land that converts into a Sarah Angel. <laughs> Seems pretty good. You just have to find a good way of turning that sacking a creature into an upside. But actually, one of my favorite cards from the entire day is just a lowly common, and that's Bind the Monster. Just one blue mana for an aura that enchants a creature. When an ETB's tap enchanted creature, it deals damage to you equal to its power. Enchanted creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step. So I have seen people call this a blue swords to plowshares. It's not that. It doesn't exile the creature. And I would much, much rather give my opponent the life, like with swords to plowshares, than take the damage myself. So this is kind of a better, although not strictly better, bubble snare. And I actually actually kind of like bubble snare. I've been, <laughs> I've been playing it in my mono blue mill forever, and it's not a bad card. But this one, you don't have to like pay four mana for the privilege of tapping the creature when it ETBs. But you do take damage equal to the creature's power, which is basically the same thing as letting the creature attack you first, which is what you have to do with Bubble Snare, right? But this works on creatures with Vigilance. This works on creatures that have, like, you know, activated abilities that might tap during your instep that you otherwise don't really have a place to cast Bubble Snare on. You know, this this taps the creature down, which is important. This does some things Bubble Snare doesn't do that I think is, uh, that I think are really cool. Uh, that said, Bubble Snare... <laughs> I keep if you're talking if you're if you're you know comparing a card to bubble snare it's probably not a very good magic card. <laughs> this is always one mana pseudo removal and I will say that in a format with you know skyclave apparition and just a bunch a bunch of ways <laughs> in almost every deck of taking out artifacts and enchantments you know um ugins and stuff like that I don't know I'm just not I'm not too convinced you know I'm kind of I'm kind of shy about playing like Banishing Light right now, <laughs> or even Glass Casket, so I'm not sure how great a card like this actually is, but again, Bubble Snare has been a good card for me in the past, and you'll never have to pay four mana for this. In a lot of cases, I think that not having to pay the four mana is probably going to be worth it, you know, taking the damage is going to be worth it. You know, like with Bubble Snare, for instance, the last thing I'm going to say about the comparison between these two cards is that with Bubble Snare, you have to wait to pay four mana to tap the creature down, and that's not very good against, like, questing beast and stuff, you know, especially if your opponent is able to stick auras or equipments or stuff like that to the creature while you're waiting to get your four mana to cast Bubble Snare. And then when you finally do, it takes your entire turn. This will never take your whole turn's worth of mana to cast unless you're really low on mana. <laughs> so there is that. And, like, you know, again, like Bubble Snare, you can't just throw it on a Questing Beast. You have to pay the four mana because Questing Beast has Vigilance. So just that might be a good enough reason.
right there. The, the fact that this works much better against Questing Beast than Snare does. But again, Bubble Snare is not the best card in the world. <laughs> so when I'm comparing a card to Bubble Snare and saying that it's not strictly better, I'm not sure how good the card is. But one mana removal is definitely something that you want to look at and discuss, which is why I've spent so long talking about a card that doesn't really look like much of anything. But I'm telling you, the card might actually be really sweet. We also got to see our last rare saga today. In fact, our last saga period. This is King Narfi's Betrayal. KNB is one a blue and a black for a saga. On chapter one, each player mills four cards. Then you may exile one creature or planeswalker card from each graveyard. Uh, on chapter two and three, until end of turn, you may cast spells among the cards exiled with King Narfi's Betrayal and spend mana as though it were mana of any color to do so. So even I have compared this to Dig Through Time on various forums and whatnot, and I really don't know that Dig Through Time is the best comparison for this, <laughs> right? I mean, it doesn't necessarily draw you the cards. That's what I've seen a lot of people say, oh, it's, you know, draw two, look at the top eight, draw two. Um, it's not necessarily that, because on some turns you're not going to be able to cast, have all the mana necessary to cast the spells you want to cast the most. And that's not even if, you know, your opponent has a five drop, you only have four mana. That's if your opponent has a three drop and you have a two drop that you'd like to cast. Well, you, you can't do that on the next turn. So it's possible, even though you do get two turns at this, uh, at casting the spells, it's possible that there are some really important spells to cast that you never get the opportunity to do so. So I don't love that. I also don't love that it's restricted to uh, creatures and planeswalkers. I, I don't much care for that necessarily. Um, against some decks, letting them mill themselves is going to be an upside, depending on what you're playing against. But of course, in a lot of decks you put this in, milling yourself is going to be an upside for you, right? And depending on what you're playing, you might be playing Egon, or some deck that wants Timurid Calls the Dead. Maybe you're playing a Grixis deck that also plays Croxa, which I think is interesting. Because on turn three, you mill your own Croxa and you mill your opponent's stuff. And then next turn, you have two mana to play your Croxa, and you still have two mana left over to play like a creature that milled into their yard which might be pretty cool. And then your Croxa just goes back to your graveyard. You can escape it later, which pretty dope, right? So I think there are some cool play lines with this card, but you have to tap out on turn three to play it and not really get any value outside of milling yourself. And then on turn four, you really have to have something to play from either graveyard in order to make the card worth it. Same ditto on turn five. And remember that you probably want to cast other spells in your hand, but, you know, at the same time, I don't want to diss the card too much because look at the top four of each player's library and over the next two turns get you cast those spells <laughs> that's really i mean i think we can agree that's a pretty good looking card especially for decks that want to play out of their own graveyard and stuff so i do like this card and i want to try some stuff with it but i think that some of the fail cases are so fail that it might not be consistent enough to really make this into competitive magic but at the same time i mean it's really tempting to just say the card's a bomb now our mythic from today is Haunting Voyage, 4 and 2 black for a sorcery. Choose a creature type. Return up to 2 creature types of that type from your graveyard to the battlefield. If this spell was foretold, return all creatures of that type from your graveyard to the battlefield instead. And it foretells for more than you would normally cast it for. It foretells for 5 and 2 black. So for the 6 mana rate, this is not better than Thwart the Grave. Because right? Thwart the Grave, you're only restricted to creature type on one of the creatures. The other one, you can bring whatever you want back. Plus, you get a discount on it. So this is just worse than Thwart the Grave when played for 6 mana. And Thwart the Grave is... I don't think it's a bad card. It just hasn't really seen any standard play. Especially considering there are better reanimation spells. You know, Agadim's Awakening, Call of the Death Dweller. You can just use Lurus and stuff. So. I think they're just better reanimation are, you know, options for most decks. I think the same is true of Haunting Voyage. You know, even if you do cast it for the seven mana, is Nagadim's Awakening a better card nine times out of ten? Right? I mean, I guess the Angels deck has, and I've already said the Angels deck has like a, a graveyard thing going on, sort of a, sort of a tertiary graveyard theme. Um, and th this card might do fairly well in that deck, but I'm not sure how much you want to play a seven mana thing in that deck that's not named Amiria's Call. So, I don't, I'm just not sure where this goes outside of, like, tribal black commander decks. So, like, zombies and vampires. 
There you go. And like Green Black Elves, that's a thing. Um, I could, that could actually be really good. Actually, in Green Black Elves, yeah, because your elves are tapping for mana. If you have the new Planeswalker in play, then your elves are tapping for black mana, helping you cast this. So you just bring back like 35 elves <laughs> from your graveyard. It could, it could work, especially in Commander, but even in Standard. Maybe this is a Green Black Elves like finisher, but again, I still think it could be a decent Angels finisher if only it didn't cost so much freaking mana that is a lot of mana so i'm just not really sure if this is going to be a junk mythic or not but i'm trending towards yes it probably will be but there might be a deck or two in the format that might might want this especially when we get down to making really janky stuff yeah probably gonna be playing this card a few times and before we stop off on our last card we did see a couple of things from kaldheim commander today inspired sphinx and wolverine riders sphinx is seven mana that's we've already established that's a buttload of mana Two, five and two blue for a five five sphinx with flying and when an etbs draw cards equal to the number of opponents you have you can pay three and a blue to create a one one colorless stopter artifact creature token with flying pretty sweet actually seven mana is so lot it's so much but if you draw three cards when an etbs it's pretty good and then some mana sync for the rest of the game so i'm not sure how good this is in like super powered up commander decks but if you kind of an intermediate level commander player this might be a really good card in your blue deck but I like Wolverine Riders even more, I think. This is six mana, which is still a lot. It's four and two green for a four, four elf warrior. And at the beginning of each upkeep, create a one, one green elf warrior creature token. Whenever another elf enters the battlefield under your control, you gain life equal to its toughness. So pretty cute. You get like a verdant force but elves, you know, it makes an elf on every single upkeep, not just yours. So again, just like the Sphinx, if you're playing against seven other people, <laughs> then suddenly you get like seven elves in a turn cycle. I guess the Sphinx is better if you got a full game of Commander going. You got a whole Chaos game with eight people, then draw seven is ridiculous on that Sphinx. But <laughs> I guess creating an elf every, every upkeep and, you know, gaining seven life in a turn cycle is... Also not shabby, so <laughs> I kind of like this thing too, even though it costs a lot of mana, but the four toughness will help it ride out a lot of removal. The six casting cost will help it ride out a lot of popular removal too, and getting a lot of life whenever you start just rolling with elves is very nice too. So <laughs> I do like the card in commander decks, but six mana is a lot for just about any other format. Aside from that, though, the very last card of the day, although, again, not the last card of spoiler season, so we've got a, couple, a little bit of cleaning up to do, but the last card of today's video is Icebreaker Kraken Sun. This is 12 mana, 10 and 2 blue, but not really, for an 8-8 Snow Kraken. This spell costs one less to cast for each snow land you control. Not snow permanent, snow land. When Icebreaker Kraken enters the battlefield, artifacts and creatures target opponent controls don't untap during the player's next untap step. Return three snow lands you control to their owner's hand. There's more text on this card. Return Icebreaker Crack into its owner's hand. So, kind of a snow deck control finisher type thing, but you gotta have six lands into play in order for this to cost six mana and be like, you know, a reasonable cost. Uh, there are some other bad things about it though, right? It doesn't just tap all your opponent's stuff when it ETBs. I would like if it did that. Um, although that would be a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I also kind of wish this just tapped on all their permanents so that you hit their lands too, but that would also be slightly too much. <laughs> but as it is, it's a huge, it's a big old creature. It's got the right creature type too. We all wanted like a Leviathan Kraken thing in the set. Hopefully a Kraken, right? Because that's where, that's where this comes from. It's where Krakens come from. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think it actually comes from Greek. I, I think that, I believe Krakens come from Norse uh, mythology, but anyway... I, I could be wrong, but in any case, um, good that we actually did get like an enormous Kraken. And I do actually kind of like it. A lot of times you see these Leviathan or Kraken type creatures that cost all the mana in the world. They're not very good. This is not actually bad. You know, like in a ramp deck that plays only snow lands, basically. You know, you have access to Cultivate and other things that put a bunch of lands out. And suddenly you get to this on like turn four, best case scenario, but probably like turn five a lot of the time. And your opponent really has to deal with it. The problem is, if they did anything on their last turn, they have an issue dealing with it some of the time. So I think that's kind of cool. Um, tapping down artifacts won't be a big deal a lot of the time. But, you know, making sure that you tap down or keep their creatures tapped down. Ziggy is sitting on the table. He's moving the camera. I apologize for that. Um, but making sure that you tap down all your opponent's creatures is probably at least going to keep them off of an attack step on their next turn, even if they can deal with the Kraken. So you got that going for you, I guess. Maybe this is a finisher in the Turbo Fog deck that I keep talking about this season. I've brought it up like three or four times. I've brought it up on stream before. Maybe this is how you finish.
finish the game. It's possible. Because you're kind of fogging when this enters the battlefield. If your opponent attacked last turn, you're kind of fogging. And you can keep returning it to your to, to your hand and then have stuff like maybe Azusa or dry it up the Elysian Grove or whatever it's called. You can play extra lands in a turn. Right? So you can return the three lands to your hand and pop this back to your hand. And then play those three lands again next turn and play it again. And then you just have your opponent in like a soft lock. Right? Can we play Pickles? Can we play Brine Elemental right now in this standard? We have to find a way to get our, all of our opponent's creatures tapped down. It's not really Brian Elemental because it doesn't tap their lands. Again, that sucks. You can't really play a... It's not really a soft lock if you're not tapping their mana down, but at least you can kind of make it to where they don't get to attack with any creatures that are currently on the board, like for the rest of the game. That could work. If you have an Azusa and a Dryad out, you're just dropping all the lands. Actually, if you have an Azusa out, just by itself, you can drop two extra lands. So you drop all three lands that it requires to bring this back. You could actually generate mana that way, couldn't you? You could tap the lands and then return the lands to your hand. With your Zeus out, you play them untapped. You tap them for mana again. And that would help you play the Kraken again. I am just coming up with all this right now. <laughs> I probably should have realized Zeus is good with this beforehand, but still, the, the Turbo Fog deck is at least green-blue already, if not um, Bant or Sultai. I'm not sure. But the Turbo Fog deck is at least these colors already, so we have the Ramp, to play, we have the, the Kraken to play, we have like the Azusa, there's I'm we can build this deck, baby. There's a there's a way to do this. And like what is it, Allrun's Epiphany, the new um the new time walk thing that makes two birds? That's seven mana anyway. You're gonna have to ramp to that regardless. If you play discontinuity in the deck to just take turns or whatever in your turbo fog deck, then like that costs a lot of mana too. You have to ramp to that. So like we're building this deck in this video, baby. We're doing it. But anyway, if you can't tell them I'm, I'm more excited about this than I should be. Because if your opponent tries to do anything, all you got to do is return it to your hand. Not that big of a deal. And yeah, returning the lands to your hand technically makes it a little bit harder to cast, but still not a bad card in my mind. As far as these huge Leviathans go, these Krakens that hardly ever see any play, I think this one actually has a chance. Sorry, I really talked about that guy for a while, and I didn't expect to, but I'm actually a lot more excited for it than I even thought when I started the video. But anyway, let me know what all your favorite cards from the last day of spoilers were, and in fact, your favorite cards from the set. I'm going to start doing that soon. <laughs> Not only do I have to do the top 10 sleepers, but we have the top 25 cards in the set coming out in the next week. Stay tuned for that. Deck Tech's coming up. Going to rank all the cards in the set. We're going to do a lot of streaming and stuff. Get on it. <laughs> like this video if you enjoyed it. And of course, sub to the channel for all that content. If you want to watch me play Magic or anything we do on Twitch, we have a lot of fun over there. <laughs> Just go to twitch.tv slash svmtgdev or hit the link in the description. Following me there is completely free and I'm trying to hit 3k followers. I'm at 2.9 right now, so it shouldn't take too many to tip the scales. Go over there and follow me. Or you can check out my Patreon if you really want to support the channel. It's just a dollar a month to vote on what content we do, which is especially relevant at the beginning of the season where you get to pick what deck techs we do first in Kaldheim Standard. So go over there, link in the description, or patreon.com slash spmtg. Uh, dollar a month's all I ask to vote. But in any case, I think that's it for now. It's actually been a really good preview season. I joked on Twitter earlier that I can't wait till Eldraine rotates so we can play with these Kaldheim cards, but I think there are plenty of them that break the mold and are able to jump into standard on day one, but we'll get to talking about what cards I think those are really, really soon. Tomorrow I've got the best of the rest in spoiler season, and then we'll get into the sleepers and the best cards. So stay tuned to the channel, sub if you can, and I will catch you cats later. I'm Deb from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind.